last summer, uh, we had a bit of extra time before we had to deliver an actual system. So uh, we used that time to play with, experiment, prototype stuff, and, and really uh, th think about how we want to build our next system. Uh, we definitely had a great time doing that, and uh, I hope we can get a bit of this across in this talk. So, but speaking of Ruger, I guess not everybody knows us yet. Um, so Ruger does social games, as we heard, mostly published on the Facebook platform. And yeah, this is um, one of our games, it's called Monster Roll, looks like. As you can see, it's all <coughs> cute and colorful, um, which might be the reason uh, why a lot of women actually are playing the movie games as well. Actually, the majority of players are women, like 70% or something. Um, yeah, but that's not what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk more about what powers these games. So um, well, here's a, a typical architecture um, overview. So uh, the, the game itself is usually uh, implemented as a separate application. Um, when it's published on Facebook, it will usually be, usually be a Flash application, um, but it might also be a native iOS app or anything else, really. And it talks uh, through uh, HTTP API through, uh, to some backend from the data center. So this the backend part is, is what I'm going to focus on today. And actually, that's just a bit of a glorified web service, if you will. So it provides uh, something like 100 API uh, functions for a typical game. Um, and the, the client will usually use these uh, API calls in an asynchronous way because we don't want our clients to wait for a response. So we care more about the overall throughput of the system than the actual latency, um, which is also nice to be there, of course. So what, is this, uh, what are the responsibilities of this backend? Um, basically, it, it will keep the, the game state and through the, the API calls uh, it gets, it will change the state, it will update the state. It will also, of course, validate if a certain transformation is valid at the given time. So we don't want to play everybody by its own rules, but uh, actually by the game's rules. So we need to make sure that this all makes sense. Uh, the backend will also, of course, uh, persist the game state. The scale is uh, actually pretty interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, that's just a high number for this Monster World uh, game. Uh, we're getting about 14 billion of uh, these API requests uh, per month. I don't know if everybody has a feeling of that's totally much or not, but um, there's one uh, website that kindly uh, publishes its, uh, its backend polls, and that's called Wikipedia. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, so that is it's in the same ballpark. They also have like 14 to 15 billion page views a uh, month. Um, well, that's the only way I'm going to compare us to Wikipedia because I mean, they do this, this great stuff uh, for humanity and we just suffocate. <laughs> um, but in fact, uh, Wikipedia is, uh, has it a bit easier than us in there because what, what they can do, uh, they can cache a lot. These the pages uh, do change, but they, compared to the, to the views, it's uh, a lower percentage, I guess. Um, and for us, this um, uh, boils down to about 100,000 database operations per second, of which half um, are actually updates. So, uh, caching is not really something that would help. Yeah, so that's what we're up against, and um, how, do we, how do we deal with it? I think this is uh, pretty unique, um, at least I haven't encountered this uh, in any other company, because um, usually um, you have pretty small teams, um, and these are independent, um, as in really independent. So uh, what we got to do last summer, namely thinking about how we want to do our system is what every team 
gets to. So you can choose your weapons freely. Um, but um, whatever you choose, uh, you're also responsible for the operations uh, of the system you build afterwards. And as uh, the people building the backend are usually uh, also just a small part of this already uh, small team, um, so maybe two or three backend developers per game, you better choose wisely what you can run and support afterwards. Um, so this, uh, yeah, everybody does what he likes kind of thingy, uh, could lead to total chaos, but um, combine this with a culture of sharing and uh, the need to take responsibility afterwards for what you produce, uh, really um, works. Yeah. So um, it's a really uh, a very open culture, so there are no, no repos you wouldn't have access to, so you can always look what other teams did, and you can also pick and reuse stuff, um, but you won't be forced to in any way, so there are no like, company libraries, frameworks, whatnot. And yeah, so instead of having total chaos, this has actually uh, produced um, this landscape of uh, games that are live currently. Um, so you see the, the, like the games logos on top and then the, the dominant uh, programming language for the backend. And uh, below that, the storage solutions or the main storage solutions that the games use. Um, so as you can see, we had a lot of success with Ruby, um, but also Erlang uh, gets a lot of adoption lately. Um, you see, as you can see to the right, you can also read this a bit as a timeline, so from left to, left to right, so the more, most recent one is actually the Erlang one. Um, and there's the three more other ways back in the pipeline. So it's really taking off into a big time. <coughs> Um, there are two very different uh, basic architectures in this landscape, so, so throughout the various uh, backends. So uh, one is this um, stateless, so-called stateless application server approach, uh, which is very common when you do web applications. So uh, if you have a server that answers your requests and it has some storage or database uh, in between when a uh, request comes in it will then kind of read everything it needs to process the request from the database, uh, also update some stuff and then finally generate uh, an answer and then does it for the next request again. So as if nothing happened before it will happily load everything it needs to process the request again and again and again. Um, and as you can see, this uh, puts a lot of load uh, on the database, which is also kind of visible in the numbers I, I said earlier, this is 50,000 updates. So the database uh, can quickly become a bottleneck. So. And yeah, when the database becomes a bottleneck, then of course you do sharding, right? You know, just after like, you have the load balancer on top, a couple of app servers behind that, and then the shared database, when one is not enough, you just use the second one, and when that's not enough, uh, you use a couple more. Uh, should you have trouble with sharding, then you're just not using enough of it. Um, and as, as a colleague of mine uh, uh, recently put it, uh, these, these stateless application servers basically go to one thing, and that is the data is never very needed. But there is hope, I mean, if you really look into the, um, into the pattern that this interaction with the user, uh, what it looks like, then you will see that it has a strong session pattern. So if you imagine the user starts playing at a given time, then it will play for a while. Usually it will help do many transformations of the same, of the same set of the data and in the game state. Uh, about a hundred interactions usually per, per session when the user plays and then it will just stop and maybe hopefully come back later, like next day or in eight hours or something. So this is um, something um, you could uh, also approach like this. 
So um, imagine you have this server with an incoming request, and we just load the whole game state when it kind of spawns up. And then it just keeps running and it just keeps the whole game state in memory and it will happily answer all the interactions, all the requests that the user generates, which um, comprises this one game session of the user. And once he's done with that, then you just dump it all back to this and also dump it period periodically in between. But you get the point. So this definitely uh, a lot less stress and labor. So this one process per active user uh, being a stateful game server um, would then hold the entire game state, the current game state um, in, in memory and it's the, the only one that can interact with this. So you have strong encapsulation and as this is one uh, process and if you kind of mentally map this to Erlang, uh, then you will know that this one process will have an, a mailbox and it will process all incoming commands it receives one after the other. So you have a very nice concurrency control. You, you need not fear that two application servers would kind of uh, access the same, uh, same data or you modify the same data uh, at the same time and you need to protect yourself against that as locks or anything. So you have the nice concurrency control through the actor model. And as I said, it, it, it loads the game state basically once and writes it back just periodically or when time occurs uh, so the user hasn't interacted for a while and it can just dump it back to this. Yeah, and that definitely solves the bottleneck uh, problem as a database. So if you have a game with like 30 second database operations, second uh, is a stateful, that uh, was a stateless approach. Uh, the, the, the stateful approach would then yield like 700. So, yeah, I guess we can handle that. And um, this is actually the, the architecture in place for the for the Erlang uh, backend we have live. And uh, I guess a couple of you might have seen the the awesome presentation that uh, Knut and Paolo, colleagues uh, of mine, Knut is here as well. Um, presented on the, on the last uh, LN user conference. So it is also available online, so if you want to know a bit more about this whole architecture and how this all works, especially in the Erlang world, um, dig into it. So that was uh, kind of what I found when I, when I came to Google. Um, so the question was how to innovate that. Put yourself in my shoes. You know. I think um, it's pretty obvious that the stateful approach uh, is very superior to the, to the stateless one. So that was clearly, clearly the way to go. You want to keep this. Uh, and also, Erlang uh, had already proven itself as a very reliable and very easy to operate system. So it also made sense to down this path. Well, yeah, you know, first world problems, <laughs> really, um, all the way, when you've done some Ruby as I did before, um, it, it also felt a bit like giving up a lot. Um, so we, um, we set out to maybe combine early entry well, while Erlang is obviously great for concurrency and it's robust and great for all things operational, uh, Ruby is also great. And it's, uh, it is much more concise and expressive in its syntax, I think, and it's also super flexible, so you can easily kind of mold it in whatever DSL-like uh, thing you want to to express your program, and that's something that's really great for development. Um, uh, oh yeah, this guy also kept haunting us a bit, so um, <coughs> I must say certainly um, Akka and JRuby would, would also be uh, something to take a very close look. Um, 
and use the JVM for prototyping. And I'm sure a future team of Google will do exactly that. Um, but at the time being, uh, I wasn't entirely sure that I want to put up this list. So it would have been an entirely new stack, uh, both development-wise, although there were some people at Google that had uh, quite a bit of Java and JVM experience. Uh, but still, I mean, especially for our team, it would have been pretty new, um, and also for operations, so there was no real operational experience uh, running a database system. So that's why we more or less unscientifically ignored this option and just tried out this hybrid approach of Erlang and Ruby, and we kind of just went forward with it and said, yeah, we will do this until we get a roadblock or something, and just start up with it. So, yeah, bring the two worlds together. Um, uh, as I said, the, the Erlang uh, part would, would be the one that has this, uh, these processes, one for a game session, holding the state. So how do you hook this up now to, to Ruby? Um, we were imagining it to just uh, send it out uh, to, to some workers uh, running the Ruby code. So these would then do the state transformation, the game state, and then send back uh, the new game state. So, um, yeah, we wanted to couple this um, most flexibly, and we ended up uh, with zero and Q in between. Uh, so zero and Q is basically, I think, their their claim is sockets on steroids. Uh, so they, what they actually have, they have. Uh, Q-like properties on top of uh, TCP or Unix domain sockets, um, and are also in-process uh, topologies supported. So it's a really awesome queuing, uh, brokerless, and lightweight and easy to use and whatnot. Super pro. Um, I don't know. Um, does Does anybody of you uh, have heard of or even know uh, a product called Mongrel Two? So, um, the Mongrel tool, it's, it's a web application server uh, that has a similar idea and it, it would also be kind of language agnostic uh, in, in hooking up its applications through zero and Q. Um, so, as this was already sorted through quite well, we just uh, adapted this, the exact same queuing layout and also the message format. Uh, that Mongo 2 uses, uh, which yeah, was just kind of a no-brainer to reuse this. Uh, so. Oh yeah, uh, thanks for your insight, Clarence. Um, indeed, indeed, it is uh, in a way it is stateless upside down, as the the Ruby workers are still stateless, right? But instead of having a shared database uh, between, uh, behind them, uh, they would get everything they need to know like this a request. So kind of, you kind of have a uh, taken sharding to the max as now every single user kind of has its own shard. So that kind of eliminates the bottleneck, um, but it also introduces a new bottleneck. So the amount of data you have to pass into the to the worker to be for it to be able to to do its transformation is something you have to keep an eye on definitely. So that kind of thing, how much data flows back and forth. So um, just for for your reference, more or less, uh, how do we technically connect the two uh, stacks? As I said, we, we use the uh, Mongol 2 uh, protocol and, and zero and queue setup. Um, then we have some Erlang code uh, that would help us generate uh, messages uh, compliant to this Mongol uh, 2 um, message format and also have setting up the zero and queue sockets and stuff. It's also a GitHub. And then um, by adapting the Mongol 2 setup, uh, we could reuse quite a bit of stuff that was available in Rubyland. So there's a, a project called RefMongrel2 um, that would interface uh, the Mongrel2 messages um, 
to the rectal hole in turn is uh, uh, the de facto standard of uh, how you hook up uh, applications to web server in RubyLand. Um, so we could just use uh, the common Ruby web uh, framework, namely Sinatra in this case. So essentially, uh, we were speaking HTTP over the zero MQ queues and could have hooked up basically any Ruby based uh, web framework. Also, like Rails or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's quite in the, I'm trying to make it out in my head. So you have the, the state for each player in an Erlang process. Yeah. Then you send the state plus an operation to a Ruby worker that does some blah blah blah, game logic, and then it sends back the new state to the Erlang process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. More or less. Uh, with, with one optimization, optimization or mention operation. Yeah, so we, we set out to Kizen and it was mostly the code. Yeah? So uh, let's look at some code. Um, here's an, an example controller. Um, as you can see, it, it specifies a game action. It kind of maps a game action to an URL pattern. And in this case, as you might be able to derive from naming, uh, we're talking about a game where, where you can shake a fruit tree. <laughs> um, and it goes on with uh, kind of like, a, as I said, DSL uh, is this big strings of Ruby. So this, uh, this app dot game action method we're calling here, it looks almost native to the language, but it isn't. So it's something we build, and it accepts uh, a lot of uh, parameters and, and options you can configure. Um, and this also uh, gives a pretty nice documentation. Uh, we actually do generate documentation from this. Um, yeah, and it's um, the, the code is basically just just the parameter parsing and then and, and all up to some model. So it's uh, yeah, skinny as controllers should be as a, as a, a Rails uh, motto. And it can't get much much less code, and and the model in turn also uh, benefits uh, from from Ruby in a way. So uh, you can have things like inheritance. So a little fruit tree uh, can happily inherit from a tree object or a tree class, and uh, it can on top of the properties that the tree might already have, uh, uh, also define new properties. These are also in a declarative way. And it, Again, it looks almost native to the language, but it's just us uh, hooking up these properties uh, to the kind of the message that will get, get sent back. So uh, defining what the what the state of this tree looks like, and the the action itself is also uh, yeah, I mean, everybody could understand what's going on here. Just increment a count here, decrement count there, set some attributes, um, yeah, that's basically it. So this is like really easy, uh, easily testable in a way. And I think it's more or less a minimal amount of code you could write to do this. Um, to address a bit the, the thing with the, how much data do you send back and forth, um, let me say the, the game state is um, split in multiple parts. So not, not every action and it's, it's all the game state. So it might be that one part is the user, or another one is the, the map, uh, the world, kind of the objects uh, that are on this map, like the fruit trees. So while Erlang does not really care about the content uh, of these actual, of these parts, which are to Erlang just some binary, and in reality, they are uh, serialized Ruby objects. Um, Erlang does need to know what action needs which parts. So it has to send in the right parts to, to be, uh, enable Ruby to process the action. Um, but that's also actually pretty easy. So if you look back to this uh, controller code, there you right, you have it, right? It's right there. So the action itself says which parts it needs to do its work. And so this, this Ruby worker knows the mapping for every action. And it can just push this information and start a 
uh, over to the other uh, core. <coughs> but the effects that you need to know that the two tree shape operation actually affects the user. Yeah. Because you can't see that from this code. That's true. That's true. That's indeed us. That's something we were struggling with it uh, on how to kind of do the encapsulation right there. Um, there were also alternative approaches like passing the user around um, instead of implicitly referencing it through the session object. But yeah, we'll get a bit to that later. And it, what's also possible, of course, is just to provide another action that would allow Erling to query this mapping at any given time. So imagine uh, that you would have uh, a restart in the, in the Erling server, and it would basically not know the, the mapping. Just has to pray. That's all pretty, pretty sweet. And yeah, it was really nice to look. Um, we had pretty beautiful code. Um, also, deployment wise, it's really a nice thing to just kind of deploy the new business logic without having to think about touching the, the, uh, the session container, basically the storage. And it, it was also. Uh, Nice to scale, so you could just have more, um, uh, more of the workers basically on one box. Or zero MQ would also uh, give you the option to have the workers on a separate machine if you would like to do that. But you could also just scale the whole thing, like early plus Ruby with a couple of workers on multiple nodes. So it's just not a problem. Uh, yeah, the performance was also uh, good, I would say. Uh, actually, there, there would be a penalty, uh, of course. Uh, but as I said, it was uh, easy enough to, to scale. So you could just kind of uh, put more hardware, basically, and get it wrong. Unless you have another problem. Yeah, so. Um, so while we were while we were exploring these these new backend concepts, um, also the the game itself took shape more and more, uh, and it, would, it, it kind of became apparent that this this particular game that we were kind of tasked to to support uh, would would rather gravitate to to large chunks of game states that you would need for each action. Um, and it would be rather hard to conceptualize against that. So we looked at the performance impact more closely, uh, for, especially for larger payloads, like uh, the payload um, that you would have to pass in and back. We compared what, what, would, what it would look like if you did a pure Erlang uh, implementation for the game logic versus the Ruby one. And um, so we, we kind of measure the system, how much we per, per, uh, per second of good support. And we also uh, did a couple of test series with uh, different numbers of workers. So this whole thing was run on an 8-4 machine, so we varied the amount of workers uh, we had running between uh, 1 and 8. And that's what it looked like for early. So we could. Uh, even with this larger payload, we could easily support something like four or even more thousand uh, requests per second. Um, and the cost uh, for doing the same thing in our kind of dream architecture uh, in this scenario uh, is indeed uh, one order of a magnitude. <coughs> so, the approach, or in Ruby, we could only do 400 requests per second with the same box, which is an 8-4 eight, eight, machine. System. But it's, uh, I mean, Edcore sounds more powerful than this box or virtual thing actually is. Uh, so it was in, in the Amazon cloud. But still, I mean, one order of magnitude, it's a bit tough to swap that. So, and, and another thing, uh, with a larger payload, uh, it is no longer CPU bound. So, um, while, while with a smaller payload, we could easily saturate the box. It was not a problem. It looked really, really nice. But with a larger payload, it, we could only kind of utilize 25% of the box. So this uh, looked, we didn't kind of dig 
too deep into it, but it looks like a, a kind of a fixed bandwidth limit. So it might be a, even a memory bandwidth limit. We hit there at about 300 megabytes per second, going back and forth between the two steps. Um, and that's not so nice to have such a uh, end to scalability on a single box. So, and also, we were kind of burned because something similar has happened before, also on this game Monster World I talked about earlier. Um, the team back then uh, hit a roadblock with their database technology at about 500,000 uh, active users. And while they were already live and kind of successful and growing, it was really painful to then kind of rethink major parts of your architecture and kind of do this uh, change and running system. So, um, yeah, coming back to the, to the happiness, uh, I think the, the happiness uh, lies indeed in the working product here. And even though it, it would have been super nice to do the whole system in this uh, kind of developer-friendly, uh, easily readable code and, and, and architecture we worked out, um, we still, in the, in the light of these effects, how the game progressed and how would, the actual product would look like and the kind of the, uh, parameters and the uh, product wizard, we actually decided uh, to uh, go for an early and only approach at this point in time. So this can be kind of considered almost a happy ending for this crowd, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but still, so, yeah, not an easy decision. So, um, again... Uh, okay. yeah. At this stage, did you consider using a port to the Ruby process instead? Yeah, we tried ports as well. They, they perform um, a bit better than the zero and queue approach. Uh, with a large payload about twice as good. Uh, but uh, it, we would lose a lot of, of the other properties that we would like to have. Because uh, when you have ports, then suddenly Erlang uh, has to kind of control uh, who it attaches to. And it would also need to distribute uh, sort of the, the workload onto the different ports. Could, could uh, we have the possibility to push the entire state down to the Ruby port then? different architecture. But you push the entire state to the Ruby port and just send the operations you want done to the current data you want it. Um, I so, so you're saying basically um, keep a kind of a, a replicate of the of the whole thing. Uh, yeah we, we thought about similar things uh, with something like say Redis as an intermediate storage in between and stuff but had properties that we didn't like so much because it would break the encapsulation and still so it was a, yeah, a trade. So, um, uh, so the thing, thing is that the best decision uh, that we could come up with was really to, to explore this pure earning approach. Uh, we, we just did this um, and here's some, some code how it would look the same action basically would look like in earning. So uh, this is you see as one as uh, the controller side of things again. <coughs> as you can see, uh, it's still the same pattern. So you get some state in, and you get send, send the updated state back out. So, yeah. <coughs> it's nicely with a um, functional uh, approach. Uh, in between that, there's a bit more lag work, I would say. So. Uh, extracting the arguments, getting the right data structures to work on, and also building the, the whole thing. Uh, it's a bit more, more explicit, you have to just write more of the stuff to get the job done, but still. And as you see, this uh, basically uh, what we talked about earlier. In this case, uh, here we have the controller also being a mediator, so it does not actually uh, delegate the user uh, modifications down to the to the shake model or the shake action of the model. So here we are uh, also dealing with the user modifications in the controller. Uh, while the model then is as trivial as it can be, so you just also have to just shake thing and uh, put a tree in and get a new tree back out and shake the model. Not so 
but it's a super uh, interesting, I guess. Uh, yeah, and instead of having the, the properties uh, on the simpler models, um, we could, for instance, also use the following records, which map quite nicely to this problem. I mean, for more complex uh, models, you would use other types like the dictionary or uh, even just property list or some sort of nested property list. But still, for, for simpler models, uh, the random records are perfect. So, um, can there be happiness without truth? Yes, there can be happiness without truth. Yeah. So, at this point, there might be kind of a bit less developer comfort zone, but on the other hand, we were now confident that we will be able to deliver a product that is really reliable and it will perform great and just great product. So and that's where we draw our happiness from my like yeah. Um, while you think about some smart questions, uh, let me briefly mention that uh, uh, Google also is always looking for uh, new uh, developers. Um, <laughs> so if, if you want to follow down this uh, path, so you have the URL right there and, and also you can uh, hook us up. Uh, so we are, I have two colleagues uh, with me here, so Chris and Knud are with me. And, yeah, and I'm also more than willing to answer any questions regarding this talk or any other stuff later on. So what are there any questions? Yes? Um, how do you dispatch the incoming um, API calls to the, to the corresponding um, online processes? Yeah, so in this uh, stateful approach, that's uh, obviously something that is very needed because you really need to identify the, the node that runs the user's session. Uh, so you will have some sort of infrastructure, uh, kind of a global registry that uh, knows about what user lives on what server and it would then just uh, route the request to that. You will probably optimize it in a way that following requests can be uh, routed directly and it would just kind of need to be rerouted should the, the client do something wrong. Um, well, yeah, Are you obvious. using Amnesia for that? Probably not. Um, uh, in the um, the Magic Land game server it's a, a single Reddit instance basically. Um, and we are looking into ways to uh, swap that out for a more distributed approach. But probably yeah, either just to custom some custom running uh, code or, or even something like two people. Mm -hmm. um, when you're sending the state between uh, the distributor and the uh, Erlang process reducer, is it all done over just Erlang distribution normal message passing? Um, between which parts of the systems are you uh, talking about? When it gets the state and puts it into the user worker. In the, in the hybrid approach? No, in the other. In the pure other. Yeah, this will just be in the same uh, node, basically. So you have the session. But does it, um, does it pull in the, the session state from the database before it creates yeah. a worker? Or in the worker? Uh, there are no workers in this sense. It's just basically That's just code, process, code operating on the data structures. And, and when you spawn up in the user session and we start playing, then we will initially load the whole game stuff. You, you mentioned the user state is stored in the uh, Erlang process. Yeah. And do you consider replicating this state away, for example, to Amnesia for high availability? No, process? not really. Um, while we could do this, uh, we were also thinking about maybe using something like We Are Core and to have like, multiple replicas and stuff. But in reality, I mean, uh, the worst thing that could happen uh, if we kind of persist this stuff too infrequently and, and uh, the, the the server process would crash, uh, all that would happen is that the user would then lose a bit of progress in the game. So, uh, and as we don't do banking or anything, this is totally acceptable and just an easier systems approach. So that's what we're going to say. Yeah? So, so what algorithm do you use for pushing the information back into the uh, data store? Um, so presumably yeah. the user walks away, they get bored or whatever it is, at some point you're going to tear the connection down, so what right. do you do? 
So uh, basically, to detect this, this fact, it's just a simple timeout. So uh, in reality, this, this user, user session process will be again server, and it just has a timeout. And whenever it does timeout, then it would just dump its whole state in a, say, a JSON serialization to disk, basically. So we actually don't use a database to store the, the game state anymore, but uh, as you may be spotted in the architecture, we use just the Amazon S3, so just basically a distributed file system where we can dump this to. We need to split it up further. Okay, so if the user crashes, they, you preserve their state, of course. If the client would crash, right. then yeah, yeah it, it, just it like would just be another timeout, or maybe it isn't even a timeout when it restarts quickly enough. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I noticed something interesting in the Erlang code uh, that you showed, like uh, how you like you record uh, like the deltas to the user state, for example, like you have a. Yeah, go back to it. Like yeah. you have a list the user of effect. increased experience, decreased energy. Uh, and does this information propagate back to the client or is it like yeah. is it like dual simulations running in parallel? Yes. Okay. It is. So that's one of the challenges in this uh, architecture that the client code needs to be in sync logically with the server code. Yeah. But you need to do that because you, the, the client will not wait uh, for, for an answer from the server. It will just assume it is okay yeah. and continue playing so the user can, it doesn't need to stop interacting and stuff. So it just needs to apply the same effects of clients on this one. Because, but have you like uh, managed to leverage this in some way? Because I find it a little bit interesting that now you have kind of separated, you know, uh, the state change and the state are two separate things now. So, I mean, those are kind of events which could be used to trigger other stuff. Uh, are you using or doing something like that at the moment? Or um, I mean, the, the, the uh, events that occur um, are, are also used for, say, uh, logging and, and other analysis features, of course. So this kind of the event stream is also yeah. logged somewhere else. Uh, but, yeah. What, what did you have in mind? No, I was thinking, because I've been thinking about this exact same approach when doing uh, like uh, non-distributed functional programming games, like uh, just one client, a desktop. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, given infinite bandwidth and uh, like uh, uh, zero latency, I mean, you could just put all the game logic on the server and then the client could yeah. get these messages and like, oh, I increased my experience, like make the uh, experience bar go up, or like true. increase the energy, and then that you could have it like be a true model view controller setup where the client is actually just a very thin client with the view and yeah. every, all the interesting stuff that was on the server. Yeah, but yeah in, a, in a perfect world yeah. where, where the internet bandwidth is kind of infinite and, and everyone, even playing casually, uh, yeah. Has this nice infrastructure at home. And there's and world peace, and you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we could save a lot of work, too. Okay. But, but on yeah. that point, I, I think you have enough internet bandwidth at the moment to send all these messages back and forth. Yeah, I mean, but. If people still, are not watching YouTube at the same time, then you're fine. You're already done. Yeah, that's true in a way, but, uh, but still, if you have a, a game where you have a, a nice inter interface uh, and just continue click, 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 um, then it is still a noticeable delay when you just wait for the response of the server. Right, so delay so your problem with bandwidth is not the issue. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe last question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Web sockets for your application because it would be possible to reduce click on the payload yeah. yeah, we actually have experimented with, with web sockets, but they are kind of awful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they just work in a very narrow uh, kind of environment and you need all sorts of fallbacks for when you're kind of out of this narrow thing. So they introduce more problems than they solve for us. But uh, we are actually using uh, service and events. So that's basically just chunk transfer 
for the for the communication back. But we, we still have requests, uh, separate requests for the uh, way to be appealed. We're running out of time, so if you have another question, please ask Martin after the talk. Thank you, Martin.